Hey, Slater Crusaders, America is the greatest country in the world. Welcome to our special Cancel Culture and the Woke Mob. We have amazing guests coming up. But first, I want to share with you this quote from Arthur Kostler. He joined the Communist Party in England in 1931, and he left it eight years later. And he was writing about why he joined. Uh, and being a communist, for many, is not an intellectual pursuit. It's a religious one. He said, I became converted a religious term, I became converted because I was ripe for it and lived in a disintegrating society thirsting for faith. I lived in a disintegrating society thirsting for faith. Sound familiar to us, maybe? Today's special is about cancel culture, the woke mob, or in other words, people living in a disintegrating society thirsting for faith and meaning and purpose and achievement. So they've turned to cancel culture to fill those voids in their life. Let me share my favorite example of cancel culture of the last year or so, and there's so many to choose from. Uh, this guy was a professor at the USC, University of Southern California Business School, and he was giving a lecture at Zoom. He's given this lecture many times over many years, and he was talking about, it was a communications course. So he was talking about filler words that are used in other countries and other languages. So in America, we say um and ah. Right when, we, when we're speaking as to fill space. He said in China, they use a different word. It's the word for that. The word is N-A-G-A. -A. Sounds like MAGA, but with an N. NAGA. And they say it many times, over and over. And he said it, and students complained. They wrote a letter. We should not be made to fight for our sense of peace and well-being at our school. And the administration caved and they fired him. And you're thinking, what are you talking about? What could possibly be wrong about that? Here's the video. Taking a break between ideas can help bring the audience in. If you have a lot of armor errors, and this is culturally specific, so based on your native language, like in China, the, the common word is that, 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 that. So in China, it might be nega, 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 nega. So there's different words that you'll hear in different countries, but they're vocal disfluencies that's saying that, 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 um, 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 er, er, er. Fired. The administration said it's simply unacceptable for faculty to use words in class that can marginalize, hurt, and harm the psychological safety of our students. Just been teaching that course for many years, using that, that example many times. One of my argument, well, my argument today is that the woke mob is growing because we live in a disintegrated society. So we live in a postmodern world. When I say postmodern, that means the era that we live in. We live in a postmodern era. And the philosophy of the day is rooted in the idea that God does not exist. So if God does not exist, then we came from nothing. Just random chance. There's no purpose, right? At best, your purpose is to be a good person, whatever that even means, because that changes with the times. There's no meaning to life, and there's no afterlife. That's the cultural soup that we've been swimming in for our entire lives, the last 100 years, certainly the last 50 years. It's nihilism. Nihilism says that life is meaningless. The problem is we need to feel like life matters. We've been designed to worship something. We have to have a purpose. And maybe more than anything, we, we are desperate for community. And really all those things can be summed up into, uh, we long to belong to something bigger than ourselves. We long to belong to something bigger than ourselves. Now that used to be God and God's kingdom, but that doesn't exist anymore. We kick that to the curb. So we find things to fill that void. And one of the things that has filled that void for many people is being a part of the woke mob. Now, when you're in this cult, you have to prove that you're more pure than anyone else in the cult as well, right? You have to prove your righteousness, prove your purity, prove your wokeness. And that's why it gets more and more absurd every single day. Last week, it was, oh, you have to be offended by Dr. Seuss. The next day, it's Pepe Le Pew. And it just gets worse and worse and worse. So what is that? Okay, that's the woke people looking around saying, I need to prove I'm the most woke. Okay, how do we do that? Uh, I'm offended by Dr. Seuss. That's how woke I am. 
And then everyone's like, yeah, 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 I'm me too, I'm offended by it too. But then someone else is like, oh yeah, I'll, I'll see you, Dr. Seuss, and I'll raise you Pepe Le Pew. I'm offended by Pepe Le Pew. And then the next day, someone comes up and goes, you know what I'm offended by? Speedy Gonzalez. And then the next day, someone goes back and says, no, 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 everyone, I'm offended by Peter Pan. Peter Pan offends me. That's how woke I am. That's how sensitive I am. Peter Pan and Dumbo were removed from Disney+. Plus. Uh, the, the, the children's category because they're too offensive, all right? So the purity level of the cult keeps going up. Does that make sense, right? This has been the hallmark of organized religions for a long, long time. I'm holier than you. I'm more righteous than you. I'm closer to God than you. That's all this is. All right. We could go on forever. We got some great guests today. Uh, let me end with this. We have, uh, f- uh, there's four groups you can be in one of four groups when it comes to the, the woke mob situation of our culture today. Which group are you in? There's one of four. Think of, uh, we're in, this is just modern day witch hunts, right? This is just, we're just burning witches. That's all this is, right? Quick aside to witch burning. Whenever kids learn about witch burning in school, it's always framed as, oh, can you believe those how backwards those people were. Those stupid idiot Christians thinking that witches existed and burning them at the stake. What a bunch of backwards idiots. Nope. You think you'd be any better? Really, you think you'd be better if you lived in Salem? By the way, 20 people were killed in the Salem witch trials. That's it, only 20. In Europe, over a 300 year period, 60,000 witches were killed. One town in Germany, 500 people were killed for being a witch, 500. That was 25% of the town. In Germany, 7,000 witches were killed. Switzerland, 6,000. France, 2,000, right? So it's not an America thing, right? My point here is, though, one of the most important things you can ever realize when studying history, when teaching history, when reading history, you would have been the bad guys. You would have been in the mob. You think if you were alive in Salem, Massachusetts in 1692 that you would have been one of the good guys? You think that? You think you would have heroically and triumphantly what? What would you have done? Like, map it out in your brain. What would you have done? You would have stopped the trials dead in their tracks, saved the lives of the accused witches. You think that? You think you would have been a voice of reason and sanity, snapped people out of their murderous, rage-filled state? Really? You think so? No, you wouldn't have. You think if you lived in Nazi Germany, you would have been the hero to rescue Jews from the SS? No, you would not have. Statistically, you would not have. I'm very proud, I'm happy for you that you think you would have, but I'm here to tell you that you would not have. And if you're in the woke mob today, you're no better. You're no better than the witch burners of the past. You're on the road to doing the exact same thing. Right now, (laughs) you're in the mob. There's four groups in the witch hunt. First, uh, the few who actually hunt witches. It's a few, it's not a large number of people. Second group, uh, it's a larger group that goes along with it. They're like, yeah, let's get them. The third group is an even larger group that remains silent throughout the entire process. That's probably who you would have been statistically during these previous witch hunts in history. And then the final group is uh, the witches. As Barry Weiss said, allow me the opportunity to try to convince you that everything that makes America exceptional, everything that makes civilization worthy of that name depends on your willingness to pick up a broomstick. And that's what we're gonna talk about next with John Nolte, how to, be, how to be someone worthy of being canceled for all the right reasons. It's next, true story, Mike Slater, spread the word. Hey, Slider Crusaders, welcome back to our special Cancel Culture and the Woke Mob. Every day, it seems, there's something else in our our culture, in our shared cultural experience that is being canceled. And the Hollywood Reporter just wrote an article the other day about how they're systematically canceling things within Disney. To talk about that, senior writer at Breitbart, the great John Nolte is here. John, how are you, sir? I'm good, thank you. Thanks for having me on. Glad you're here. I got some big picture questions that we got to talk about, but let's start with Disney first. What is Disney doing? Well, according to the Hollywood Reporter, there Disney is meeting regularly with a bunch of woke activists to decide what content of theirs is appropriate 
or inappropriate, what content needs to be blacklisted. People use the word canceled. I prefer the word blacklisted because what we're seeing today is no different from the Hollywood blacklist of the 1950s. And uh, they're either going to censor that content or erase it entirely like they did to Song of the South, or they're going to put uh, warnings at the beginning and tell us how to think about that content. They're, gonna, they're going to interpret art for us, which is also a form of fascism because no one should be telling us what to think about things. We've, what have we seen so far? So this week was Pepe Le Pew, Speedy Gonzalez, of course, Dr. Seuss. The Muppet Show last week had a warning on it. What, do, anything else top of mind? Well, it's, it's you know, going, the, the, the Simpsons deleted an episode. That's right. Uh, that Tina Fey show, I forget the name of it because I never watched it, but the one with Alec Baldwin, they deleted a bunch of episodes. So even if you buy the digital copies, say you buy it on Vudu or Prime Video, you own the digital copies. You're, they're, they're going in there and taking them away from you. So they're That's erasing weird. all this stuff. And I just watched uh, Mad Men again, and there's a blackface episode in there, and there's this massive condescending warning beforehand telling me how to think about that blackface moment, as though I don't already know. So what's the line here? Because obviously you can go back and uh, you can cancel someone, anyone, for any, right, for some reason, right? <laughs> and anyone could be offended by anything. So we could literally cancel everything. What do you think is an appropriate line? Is there an appropriate line? No, I'm, I'm a free speech extremist. There, there is no appropriate line. Everything should be out there. Everything should be uncensored. Everything should be available. Um, even things that are grossly racist, including Birth of a Nation or that one Dr. Seuss book. And, and uh, it should be debated among the public. We shouldn't have people coming on before Gone with the Wind telling us what to think about a movie. It should be a debate we have among ourselves. I don't need a bunch of left-wing fascists telling me how to think. So I would, I think every, unless it provokes, openly provokes violence, unless it violates the law by telling people to go out and hurt other people or telling people to go out and commit violence, it's just an open violation of the law. There should be nothing that's censored, nothing that's canceled, nothing that's blacklisted. Let me play devil's advocate. I agree with you 100%, but let me play devil's advocate. So uh, you say it has to be openly against the law or openly cause violence. What if a depiction of a black person is so demeaning and so othering that that creates uh, a disgust in someone towards black people, which then creates results in discrimination and potentially even violence? Yeah, there is a price we pay for the beauty of free speech. And the price we pay for the beauty of free speech and the beauty of, 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 uh, of free expression, especially in art, is that sometimes when you look at a movie like Natural Born Killers, uh, that will so move someone, someone who's already twisted, somebody who's already broken, to go out and do something terrible. So as a culture, we have to ask ourselves, do we want to pay that price? Because we're all at risk. It's not just black people who, who face uh, that sort of violence. Uh, look at how some people like myself, Southern people, Southern white people are portrayed in movies. We're portrayed as hicks and awful and evil, and, and we're all Klansmen. Um, so that could definitely provoke someone to commit an act of violence. But we have to ask ourselves, since we're all at, at equal risk when it comes to free expression, are we willing to take that risk? And it's a very small risk. It's a much smaller risk than driving a car uh, in order to, to, to live in a free country. And as someone who is frequently targeted by Hollywood, an older white male who lives in the South, I'm willing to take that risk. Mm. And that's really well said. Take us back to the 50s. You mentioned this is like the, the blacklisting of the 50s. What happened then? What are exactly. the similarities? Well, in, in the, what people need to, I just wrote a piece about James Gunn, the Marvel director, who's defending the cancel culture. And all he's doing is retroactively defending the 1950s blacklist, which we've all been taught was one of the worst periods in our country's history. But what happened in the 1950s? It wasn't the government blacklisting anyone in the 1950s. It was private corporations in the form of Hollywood studios and sponsors, television sponsors, it was private individuals like directors and producers who were saying, I'm not going to work with people who believe this, who have who hold these beliefs. 
And and what were what were the what were the rationale? What was the rationale for this? The same rationale we're hearing today: safety, patriotism, the greater good. The 1950s blacklist had nothing to do with the government. It was private corporations and private individuals deciding they were not going to work with certain people. That's the exact same thing that's happening today. So when a guy like James Gunn says, oh, there's nothing wrong with the cancel culture the go- because the government isn't involved, he's retroactively defending the 1950s blacklist because there's no difference between the two. Yeah. How did that end? How did that 50s blacklisting end? And I asked that, hopefully we can end this eventually too. It ended after a long time, and this is gonna take a long time. What happened in the 1950s was a moral panic. And that's what's happening now, it's a moral panic. And when it was over, just as history always has, the people who defended that moral panic and participated in it, the mob, they were remembered as liars and fascists and villains and cowards and quislings. Mm. And when this moral panic is over, just as there is no time in history when censors and closed minded and people that try to restrict free expression have ever been remembered as heroes, as anything other than villains and quizlings. And someday this moral panic is going to come to an end. People are going to wake up and the backlash is going to be too strong and they're going to go too far. And the James Gunn's and the Charles Blow's and all these other fascists, they're going to be remembered as villains, as backwards, the same people that persecuted Copernicus. Mm. I look, I look at you say same pe- pers- people as persecuted uh, Copernicus. I, I think of, and this is maybe a dramatic example, but they're definitely in the same family of uh, ISIS destroying architectural yep. uh, monuments in, in, in Iraq and whatnot. Um, yeah, you, can, you can draw a straight line from ISIS to Antifa, and Antifa is nothing but the left's shock troops. It's nothing but the left's and the establishment media's brown shirts. That's all Antifa is, which is why the media and the left defend Antifa, as Antifa tears down statues and burns down predominantly black neighborhoods. So the question is, why do they do this? What's what's is it is there evil intent? Or is it with the best of motives? What, what do you think is the predominant drive for, for canceling? It's, it's two things. You have, you have cowards who go along to get along. They don't have the moral courage to say this is wrong. They're too worried, of, like James Gunn. He's too worried about losing his job. He's too worried about losing his social status. And then you have people who are just evil. I mean, th- there's a reason why um, uh, people who, all these woke people that we discover are, are in real life racist. How many woke people who claim to be woke have we discovered, especially in Hollywood, uh, who, who have we discovered are racist, who we discovered are sexist, um, yeah. also embraced woke? Well, why do they embrace woke? Because racist and sexist are bullies at heart. And being woke is being a bully. And and that's why racist and sexist are attracted to the woke movement. It's it's the same thing. So yes, there's a lot of evil going on, and then there's just people that don't have the moral courage, like people at the New York Times, to stand up to all this censorship and all this blacklisting. It's so bizarre. Um, I've never heard, or would never have heard, of minstrel shows if it weren't for the woke mob telling me that everything is a throwback to a minstrel show. Remember when, when Cat in the Hat was canceled the other day? And the uh, LA Times or the AP had a thing that said, uh, "Well, the Cat in the Hat, one of his most popular stories, is still in publication for now." <laughs> I was like, for, now. "For now, what Cat in the, And and I was like, "What's wrong with Cat in the Hat?" So I had to go back and read these people from University of San Diego, the education department, who are leading this whole thing. Anyway, they did this whole thing about how Cat in the Hat is a minstrel show. Everything's a minstrel show. What is that? Why are we hearkening back to things that no one has, that has no connection to today whatsoever? It's 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 a buzz term. And I, how do you defend a minstrel show? You can't. <laughs> so that's why they use that term. Well, this is a minstrel show. And all you can do in response is be on defense. Well, no, it's not. And that automatically puts you on defense. So they create a, a ludicrous argument that, that, that nobody can defend. It's like saying that, that uh, language, these words are violence. These words make me unsafe. That's one of the things you see the media doing now to try and blacklist uh, people like Breitbart and Fox News and successfully blacklisted Alex Jones is they, they use the term unsafe uh, so that, oh my gosh, this is violence now and you can't commit violence. And it's all just a way of creating an argument that, that nobody can win and nobody wants to argue in favor of minstrel shows or racism or, or, or violence. It's but a I tactic. Can argue in fa- 
It's totally, but I could stand up in defense of Pepe Le Pew, right? That seems a little more reasonable, which is my last question. What do we do? What do we do? Because it's so easy, and I think conservatives, I've done this for a long time, where they come in and they try to cancel something and we laugh at it. We're like, ah, ha, ha, these people are so silly, so goofy. But they're gaining momentum and they're really winning in their march through the institutions. And now we see corporate business, the last domino to fall in this march. Uh, caving as well. So we're seeing real life ramifications of all this. So we can't laugh it off anymore. So what is a conservative or someone who's concerned about this to do? Well, I think you're right. I think that we can't laugh. And I think that, that we've, we're so used to being in a situation where we're pointing and laughing and we're pointing out the hypocrisy and we're pointing out the double standards and we're appealing to decency and I think that what we're learning now is that that's a total waste of time because the left's not gonna be happy until we're all blacklisted, until Breitbart News is no more and your show is no more and we're all removed from the public squares of, of Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. Really people need to start building their own thing. People need, uh, people always laugh. Well, uh, what are we supposed to do, build our own banks? Well, guess who built their own banks 75 years ago? Black people, when they were segregated. Yeah, you gotta build your own banks and you gotta build your own internet. And you can build an apple because someone else built an apple because we're about to be a very even more divided as a country and, and, and conservatives and conservatives idea and right of center people and people who believe in things like traditional morality and who believe crazy things like men are men and women can't tr magically transform into men. But we're going to be marginalized and we can either start building, building our own thing. And that's what black people did when they were segregated by the Democrats. During Jim Crow, they built their own communities and their own banks and their own businesses and their own infrastructures. And that's what we're going to have to do. And people need to stop. It's very easy to point and laugh and to ridicule and to scream hypocrisy. Uh, but and we've been doing that for 20 years, ever since the, the, the internet really took off. But look where it's gotten us. It's just getting worse and it's gonna get, I mean, right now, CNN is, openly and proudly trying to get Fox News. I'm no Fox News fan, but they're openly and proudly trying to get Fox News blacklisted to get cable carriers to remove them from their cable pro, uh, cable packages. You can't reason with people like that. We need to build our own thing so that we can return uh, once we're erased because eventually we're all going to be erased. The world is gonna look very different today than it, uh, in five years than it does today. Wow, even worse. I share that dystopian vision, uh, yeah. unfortunately. John Nolte from uh, Breitbart. John, appreciate you, sir. Yes, my pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Have a great day. Keep it up. And uh, if I can give the first a plug here, and you can download the first app on your smartphone, and we're trying to decentralize ourselves. That's what we're doing here. I'm grateful you're here for it. True story. Mike Slater, spread the word. <laughs> Hey, Cider Crusaders, welcome back to our special Cancel Culture and the Woke Mob. So we just talked to John Nolte from Breitbart uh, about some of the craziest examples of cancel culture and why it's happening. We're going to end the special with someone who was, in fact, canceled. And right now, I want to go to our friend Alfonso Rachel from Bronze Serpent Media. Zo, what's going on, brother? All right, man, a lot going on. A lot of craziness going on. I guess that's why I'm here. <laughs> the crazier <laughs> things get, the more we got to talk to Zo. Right? Uh, that's so when you I know you're in trouble. <laughs> uh, I want to talk to you about what we do. Um, mm -hmm. How do we get out of this mess? What is a what is a morally courageous person to do? But before we get to that, just like off the top of your head, what's one of the craziest examples of cancel culture for you? I think uh, with with uh, cancel culture, the craziest example of uh, when you have oh, man, let me be just let me just go ahead and be politically incorrect here. When you have people who are transgender, uh, people who are beset on canceling out. <laughs> what they were actually born as. They want to kill what they were uh, actually born as off and become something else while trying to lecture us about things that we need to cancel. Um, I think that in itself is, is kind of crazy and, uh, and uh, people really should stop listening to that. Wow, you know what? Okay, so when you said transgenderism, I thought you were going to say, oh, mm. um, uh, what's her name? Abigail Schreier, who wrote the, one of the book about transgenderism and Ryan Anderson, mm. who wrote when Harry became Sally, and Amazon and Target canceling them. But man, you took it the Zoe way. That's such a good point. <laughs> These people canceling themselves, like their own true mm. identity. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, you wanna talk about discrimination. 
And <laughs> you want to talk about a hate crime. It's like you look in the mirror and say, I hate what I am, and I'm going to cancel that self out. And then I'm going to project that onto other people, and I'm going to get a whole, I'm going to have a whole movement surrounded me and be at the core of this whole movement to be able to cancel out reality and make everybody else forfeit reality and sub, uh, be submit, uh, in submission to my fantasy. Oh, so we're a minute in, and that's brilliant. That is so smart. Let me focus on the, the centering of it, the narcissism of it. Um, mm. Let me just speak more to that, right? Because that's so important um, to realize how just insanely narcissistic our culture has become. Mm. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, thought you, I thought you. I thought you. I thought you were gonna give me some more, man. I was like, oh man. Yeah, no, yeah. no, no. That's Tell it. I want you to take it. Eyes, I want you. To... Well, the thing is, <laughs> you know, the, the the word the word of God, man. Uh, and I, I just got to bring it there because if, we, if we're talking about a solution to this, man, the word of God has already yep. warned us about this. You know, God gave us this very reme You know, this remedial truth. Uh, I created man. I created them, man and woman. So a basic spiritual biological truth. And God's like, watch this. They're gonna mess with it. Right? It's like, and here we are. And this isn't a new thing, man. This isn't a new thing. This is a challenge that is, has uh, befallen man for a long time. And we're just seeing it surface again uh, with steroids, where people are going to take these, these very basic truths and decide that, you know what? No, I don't believe that. I want my own truth. And that's why we keep having these problems. Mm. Yeah, where God used to be at the center now, man is. Mm -hmm. It's pride. That's the root of it all. Absolutely. Um, that's it. And it always is. Always is, always has been. All right, so let's get mm -hmm. to solutions. What? Mm -hmm. And it's so hard because people want the button, right? I get that we have listeners, I'm sure you do too, who call in and they're like, Slater, what do we do? What do I do? What do I do? And I think we so, we're so like instant gratification and Amazon mm -hmm. primed that we think we can just like press the button and it's solved. And yeah. I don't think that's the case. First of all, do you want to speak to that first? You're absolutely right, man. This is uh, this has been a long time coming. It's probably going to take a long time to get out of it. It takes patience. It takes stamina. It takes um, mm. diligent uh, prayer. It takes, you know, we've been given the warning about this. That's the thing about it, man. And, um, you know, the, the word of God tells us that, you know, the, the devil works in subtleties. That's 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 the first thing that we learn about him is that he works in subtleties, meaning that we can look at all these things. And we say, oh, that's not going to be a problem. That's not going to be a problem. And one of the big problems that we have um, Slater is that we don't seem to understand that life and death is in the power of the tongue. And we have given the left, the godless, so much power to control the language, right? They can, we, we, they, when they, when, when they want to institute this stuff, they have so much power over the language, how things are communicated, whether it's education, news, entertainment, they have all the powers of the communic of communication. And we don't have as much of a of a, a front to do that. We have reasoned people like yourselves. We have the you know we have the reason, but that's a language that we already understand. We get the reason. Mm -hmm. We're dealing with people who are not speaking the language of reason. They're given over to imagination. That's where they live. All this stuff is is, is stuff that they're in fear of things that they imagine, things that they imagine that they're entitled to, and they have a language base of what they speak in, in order to convey these things. And that's just not where we are. And it's hard to combat that. As you were talking, I was thinking of some examples. So like unsafe comes to terms, like if, if someone said something, like if you said something, like the comment you made about transgenderism earlier, that's mm -hmm. violence and it's unsafe. And then they make up terms, right? Like white fragility. So when the left makes up a term, a concept like white fragility, now we're automatically playing defense, and the best we can say is, "Oh, there's no such thing as white fragility." But that's just giving right. it even more life. So, absolutely. Like, do we ever get on the offense, and how do we get on the offense? Man, you know what? It, it's uh, allow them to do themselves. It's just like you said. Whatever yeah. you know, when they when they make these charges, when they make these accusations, it's a projection of themselves. And you're right, man. Uh, conservatives, too often they get way too defensive about it. They let their national pride get in the way, or even in, uh, since a lot of conservatives happen to be white, they do get defensive about, um, about, their, their, about their race. And I can understand that. And this is being engineered. They're trying, to turn, they're trying to pit people against each other. It's time for conservatives to really understand who Democrats are, not just what they do. This is not some new Democrat party. This is who they've always been. They've always been rebellious against the Constitution. They were rebellious against the Constitution uh, with the Confederacy. They're rebellious today. And when you have conservatives saying there's no such thing as white privilege, well, you just wiped the Democrat slate clean. When you say that there is no systemic racism, you just wipe the Democrat slate clean. And once you've done that, you've, you've, you've given away your weapons. Matter of fact, the Democrats actually gave you weapons 
to combat them with, and then conservatives dismissed them, right? They said, well, you have nothing to charge Democrats with, and people are obviously angry about this stuff, and when you dismiss the Democrats have actually done it, Democrats will take that, and they will turn around and put it on you, and that's why the culture hates us so much. So you're saying it's Democrats in history who have exhibited white privilege? Oh, absolutely. The discrimination center. Yes, they are the apartheid party. That's who they've been. But slavery, uh, institutionalized racism, uh, revocation of voter rights, civil rights, all that sort of stuff, the stuff that America is still so bitter over today is the stuff that Democrats have done. We talk about high incarceration rates, uh, high, uh, high high school dropout rates, unemployment, drugs, you name it. These are places where Democrats control and they keep a stronghold on these people. That's systemic racism. While you have conservatives say there's no such thing as systemic racism, it's like you just took, you just blew your shot on destroying their Death Star, the weapon that they keep using against us. And this is how they're pushing in Marxism, socialism. Conservatives need to understand that this isn't new. Socialism isn't new with the Democrat Party. Communism isn't new with the Democrat Party. The institution of being able to make somebody pay for what somebody else feels entitled to, whether it's by socialism, communism, or slavery, that's not a new thing with Democrats. And conservatives we need, really need to understand that about the, uh, the Democrat Party. So let, let's act it out. So, because uh, I want to help our viewers and me who are in these one on one conversations with people. So, let's say I'm a Democrat and I come mm -hmm. to Zoe and I say, hey, listen, man, America it has systemic racism in it, um, mm -hmm. and it. And it's preventing people like me, oppressed people like me, from succeeding. What do you say? I say, yeah, I, I agree. There's definitely systemic racism. That's why I don't vote Democrat. <laughs> Simple as that. Now, from there, it's like, oh, okay, now we need to explain that. As well, the things that, you know, what the uh, um, the instances of arrested development, the, the discontent, uh, the strife, look at where this stuff is taking place. It's all in Democrat uh, 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 control. I'm sure they like Google. I'm sure they like Wikipedia. Let's go take a look. Let's go take a, a look at the hotbeds of systemic racism. Uh, even if you want to say that there's... Um, uh, the prison industrial complex. Okay, well, let's go take a look at where these areas are. Let's take a look who occupied the uh, uh, um, the institutions of legalism. You got legions of liberal lawyers and activist judges. Who do you think putting all these black folks in jail? Right. So you know, when you look at it, you want to if they want to look at the charts of who the representation is. There, it's always going to come up Democrat where they have all these grievances of this systemic racism that they're talking about. So it's like we we both got a phone, we got an iPhone. Let's take a look, right? I know you saw the story the other day of the Baltimore, uh, the, the kid in Baltimore who thought he was going to graduate this year, and mm. it turns out he failed 22 classes and only passed mm. three and had a 0 0.13 GPA when, and was ranked right in the middle of his class and had to go back wow. to freshman year. And it's like, mm. hey, that's Baltimore. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Baltimore's, right, that's not a conservative uh, bastion uh, keeping <laughs> this black student down. Why do people not right, see right. this, what you're saying? Well, the, the, all the things that we're meant to see are controlled, you know, by Democrats. Man, it's I, I hate to say it, but it's like they own everything, you know. And um, okay. so, you know, and where where Republicans need to understand when we talk about this language, Republicans need to understand that a lot of the worldview that they have, you got to remember, it's been Democrats who've been educating people for for several generations. That's why a lot of Republicans yeah. really don't know who the Democrat Party is. That's why a lot of Republicans, even a lot of, to their own peril, don't even know their own roots. They know a lot about what the Republican Party is by what they have learned through Democrats, no matter how independent of mind thinking that they are. I see it all the time. It's like, you didn't learn that from what it is to actually be a Republican. You learned that from Democrats. Mm. Wow. Um, okay, let me, uh, let's get personal for a second. So I am going <laughs> in my church, I'm going this weekend to a diversity meeting Oh, man. Uh, for millennials and Gen Z members of mm. our church. And I just sneak into the millennial category, so I guess I'm invited. Um, <laughs> so diversity is one of these buzzwords, right? You got to be for diversity. Mm. What, um, what's your advice slash what, what, um, how, would you, how would you properly define diversity or take the term back, if you will? Oh, I, I hope that conservatives, you know, will understand that diversity and divide share the same root. And, you know, so when, when you, this, this fanciful, this, this nice sounding language of diversity, that's all it is. It's, uh, it's, it's this soft, uh, flowerful uh, segregation that they're trying to do and bring everybody in and try to force 
this this good intention, feel goodism of uh, look how good I am. Because see, here, here's the thing about about Democrats, man, and particularly you know white Democrats, they have a fetish for supremacy. The supremacy doesn't stop. These white liberals are still the same white supremacists that Democrats have always been. They're such white supremacists that they want to make themselves out to be even better than other white people. And their, and their big pat on the back that they want to have is how, look at how accepting and tolerant I am of other people. And the thing that the, the real condescension here, Slater, is that these people, when they talk about this white supremacy, they act like the only way that we can actually have equality is if we forfeit our white supremacy because it ain't like you can take it from us. So we're going to be the nice, good white people and we're going to step down from our superior position. Everything about it is an admission and a boasting and them being the white supremacists themselves. Mm. Mm. Let, me, let me add a potential nuance here. I wanna see if you agree. Uh, I've always said there's leaders and followers with different things. And, and like global warming is a good example. Like you have the activists and then you have people who are like, oh, I like clean water and whatever. And they follow blindly perhaps, even with good intentions, the leaders. Do you find that to be true with these people as well? Slash, if I'm talking to an activist, like a racial activist or whatever, I could speak differently than to the well-intentioned regular person who's like, yeah, diversity is good. Do you agree with that division? Like, do, do you think there's a distinction there? And should one speak differently to different people in that case? It sounds, uh, if, if I'm hearing you right, man, it's, you know, we're talking about, you know, those pulling on the heartstrings. Uh, you know, we're tapping into that feel-goodism, tap, tapping into people's self-righteousness. These are easy things to appeal to, man. They're, they're so easy to appeal mm -hmm. to. I, I want to, um, because that, that reminds me of like uh, Thomas Sowell. And Thomas Sowell gives a great example. And, uh, you know, he says when a person gets out there and he talks about, uh, you know, we need to have clean water, right? How are you gonna argue against that? You know, they've already taken the position that we need to have clean water. And when you try to say, actually, man, the water's not that bad, you're already gonna be the bad guy, right? <laughs> and then for the, and then, but, but you gotta be able to trap them in their circle and say, okay, they want clean water, that's fine. Everybody can appreciate that. But at the same time, you're also, people are concerned about how much chemicals are in the water. It's like all these chemicals in the water. So why do you think there's all these chemicals in the water? Because you always have this person telling you that the water's not clean enough. And then when, you, when the water's not clean enough, well, you got to add more chemicals. So which one is it going to be? At some point, you need to understand that, hey, instead of letting the government sucker you into getting more wa money out of you to keep water clean, why don't you say, hey, you know what? I'd like to keep that money. And if I want to feel more secure about my water, why don't I just go buy my own filtration system? Mm. Alfonso, Rachel, how do people find you, man? How do people watch you, follow you? Thank you, man. I'm at uh, bronzeserpentmedia.com, and they can catch, uh, you know, my ramblings on uh, on the on the Zoloft, uh, the Zopium Den, rock out with my music project, 20 Pound Sledge, and, you know, just trying to, you know, rock the gospel and the culture, man. Love it. Bronze Serpent Media. Let's talk often, Zo. Appreciate you, man. Thank you, man. Night. Have a great day, brother. Always great. Mm -hmm. Always awesome. Uh, all right, coming up next, we'll talk to someone who was indeed canceled. Let me say one last thing about Zo. If you're going to a diversity seminar and, and they control the language, right? Diversity, diversity, diversity. Come in beforehand and say, even before they start, I'm for unity and have them fight against unity and say, no, no, we don't want unity. We don't want unity. We want diversity. And like, no, no, no. We stand for unity. Who's with me? True story. Mike Slater, spread the word. Hey, Cider Crusaders, welcome back to our special cancel culture and the woke mob. So we've gone through many different examples of people being canceled uh, and, and why. I wanna talk to one of those people, Dr. Kelly Victory. She's a trauma, mass casualty, and public health expert. Dr. Victory, how are you, ma'am? I'm well, thanks. Thanks for having me. So you've been canceled. You've been, uh, you've been kicked off YouTube. Everything you're on on YouTube is taken down, which is amazing. That means back at headquarters of YouTube, they must have a Kelly Victory algorithm, right? Like an AI <laughs> search bot for anything that you're in, right? So, and they take it down immediately or how's that work? 
Well, sometimes things will have will be able to make it for a matter of days or even weeks. Other things get down within a matter of hours. And there is some algorithm. God only knows what it is. It certainly hasn't been shared with me other than some of the emails um, or feedback that I get from YouTube when they censor something. Let's, let's call it what it is. When they censor something that I've posted will give me uh, some feedback like um, this was taken down because you violated, quote unquote, our community standards and then they go on to say that that community standard is that I've said things that quote unquote do not support the stance of the World Health Organization mm. uh, so that gives you a little insight into uh, what it is that they are using as their parameter for what's right and what's wrong Wow that's an amazing thing that that's they're the arbiter they're the standard yeah. of truth and if you go against anything well, they say which is absurd you're, you're taken down well, and let's be very clear, Mike, you don't know who these people are, who the arbiters are. It's very clear. I'm on Twitter as really, you know, clever handle Dr. Kelly Victory. Uh, people know exactly who I am. Uh, I'm out on YouTube as Dr. Kelly Victory, and my credentials are there for people to see. Um, yet the people behind the scenes, the people who are doing the censoring, are virtually anonymous. Uh, they are a faceless, unknown group of people. Uh, who are the fact checkers on Twitter? One never knows. Uh, we surmise that it's some band of 20-something-year-old uh, people who follow algorithms that have been set out by the powers that be, but we never get to meet them. So we are censored by a faceless, anonymous mob uh, and a faceless, anonymous group of people who are the arbiters of what they determine is uh, worthy of being shared with the public and what isn't. And it's extraordinarily so, dangerous. So a lot of the stuff that you've been censored for is COVID related, right? You were on Dr. Drew's show and that was one of the videos that was taken down and this is all a conversation mm -hmm. about COVID. And they say, right, they say that to raise the stakes, that this is of the utmost health importance, that you're spreading misinformation. Uh, right. Well, what? exactly. Yeah, go, yeah so, so that's their standard. So that's, that's their argument. How do you rebuttal that? Right, and that's their argument without actually responding with facts. What they generally will say is you are spreading misinformation. That is code for you are saying something that goes against their prescribed narrative, whatever that narrative is, without then arguing with you on the actual science. And I would say that, number one, first of all, we are not arguing about whether Kelly Victory has a constitutionally protected right to free speech, which, by the way, I do. But that's not what this is about to me. This is the importance of this, Mike, is that without free and open discussion, there is no advancement in science and medicine. Uh, we are supposed to not only encourage, but really foster open and vigorous debate on the topics. You know, when we talk about misinformation or saying things that, quote, are inconsistent with the accepted science, let me remind you, there was a time when the accepted science said that the world was flat, you know, or that the female-only affliction of hysteria was a result of a woman's uterus running rampant through her body, and it could only be cured by a hysterectomy. That was the accepted science until people pushed back and offered an alternative viewpoint. So I would submit to you that without that open debate, without the ability to have vigorous discussion and disagreement, we never get to with the actual truth. So what I did in the, the initial uh, video that was censored of mine was now just about a year ago was the initial video I made about COVID, which was simply trying to bring a more balanced and thoughtful response to what I saw at the time as an ensuing uh, panic uh, amongst the, the, the public and to bring sort of a more measured, thoughtful approach to it on everything from what is the immune system and what are antibodies and, and to try to educate people about uh, things of that sort, the, val the validity of wearing masks for healthy people and the idea of mm. quarantine. And that is what really started the firestorm and I think put ultimately a target on my head as someone that they needed mm. to silence. Yeah, how dare you bring measured, <laughs> measured comments to a, to a hysterical situation. Um, you remind me. You remind me of uh, Michael Crichton's uh, speech he gave at I think Caltech about 
the abysmal history of consensus science and how there's no such thing as yeah. consensus science because if there's a consensus then it's not really science so right. let me ask you this though this is kind of a tough question where where do you draw the line where 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 would one i don't know is there anything that's worthy of censure is there anything that's worthy of censorship if you were running youtube where, where do you draw that line at all well, I, I think there are things that constitute hate speech, for example, or things that are fomenting uh, and encouraging violence or encouraging illegal activities, those sorts of things. But this is in, so insidious, Mike, because you have to remember the internet, for example, is relatively new. It's really, you know, the early 90s. Uh, and then we moved into the whole social media platforms. But people have been led to believe that they have the ability now to go out and research on their own that they have the ability rather than going the way we did in the old days to you know the library and pulling out books that we have the ability to go onto the internet or social media and educate ourselves well that's great until you enter censorship and then people believe falsely that they are able to educate themselves when they're only being given half of or a portion of the story when you can only actually access certain things because the rest has been silence. It's been eliminated. So people believe falsely that they are informed and that is very scary. So would I censor certain things if I were the, you know, if I were queen of, of the internet? Yes, things that clearly constitute hate speech or are otherwise dangerous to the public because it's fomenting violence, for example. But giving people the opportunity to hear alternative viewpoints, and frankly, from people, let's face it, again, I think I certainly have the table stakes. You know, I have been educated at some of the premier institutions in the world. Uh, it's not as if I come without any background in this, yet I'm not even allowed to know who those people are who are deciding that what I have to say is unworthy. I guarantee that whatever fact checkers are behind the scenes taking these things down are doing, as you say, they're following an algorithm rather than saying, no, Dr. Kelly Victory, let's let's mm -hmm. talk about that study that you interpreted to mean X because we interpret it to mean Y. Let's have that debate. I'll have that debate all day long, but having a faceless mob that is not just silencing you, Mike, but trying to shame you. They can't, they, they're trying to shame you into silence. They're trying to make it so uncomfortable, so unpleasant that you will say, oh my gosh, I'll, I'll, I'll just shut up because I don't want to suffer the slings and arrows any longer. And that's what's so insidious about this. They are not mm. calling me to, to uh, debate or to justify my position. They're calling me to yeah. shut up. Yep, that's what we always say. The solution to this is more speech, not, not less Correct. speech, of course. Uh, Dr. Kelly Victory, uh, trauma, mass casualty, public health expert, canceled culture victim, but I'm, still gl I'm glad that the first is still here, and I'm glad that you're still speaking out. Doctor, thank you for your time. I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks, Mike. Yeah. More, more measured conversation is a good thing, which again is why I'm so grateful for the first. We're one of the, the, the fewer, fewer alternatives. Uh, you know, when everything can be, when everything's got to go through the the big corporate Silicon Valley oligarch, they're the gatekeepers. They can shut it down. That's why we need more like the first. That's why I'm grateful you're here too. True story. Mike Slater, spread the word.